We are so grateful that you've taken the time to be here. Would you, if you're in-house, would you please help me in joining those watching online today? Thank you for joining us. We're so grateful that you are here. It is a great day to be in God's house. We are in week two of a series called Marked, and we started last week on a journey with Jesus. We started in the book of Mark, and we're talking about Jesus' encounters and his interventions he had with people. We've been focusing on how Mark is different than any of the other Gospels. It focuses less on what Jesus said and more on what Jesus did. His interactions that truly marked the lives of people. You ever had a person you come in contact with in life that marked you and you're never going to be the same again? Come on, 11 o'clock. This is what Jesus does when we have a personal encounter with him. And so last week... We started in Mark chapter 1, and we're going to be on this journey for quite a while with Jesus in the book of Mark. Matter of fact, we ain't even going to get out of the book of, or out of the first chapter for the first three or four weeks, y'all. We're going to be here for a minute. So turn with me, guess where? Mark chapter 1. I don't have to say that for the next couple months for you to know where to turn. Mark chapter 1, as we remain standing for the reading of God's word today, Mark chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 16. Going through verse 28. If you don't have your Bibles today, you can see it on the screens. And as you are turning there today, we also turn our attention to uh, Florida, to South Carolina. We know that there are many that watch from those areas that are a part of this church, even though they don't even live in the same state. And so we want you to know that our, our hearts are for you, are with you, our prayers are with you as you uh, are dealing with such devastation down south. And we believe that. In the midst of it all, God will prove himself faithful to you time and time again. Amen. Would you please help them show our support for them? Amen. Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 16, says this. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee. Now let's pause there for a second and know that last week we talked about how John came before, right? John proclaimed and prepared the way Jesus comes into his calling. He's anointed and sent out into the desert. He comes, he's ready to start his ministry now. In verse 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Letters in red, y'all. This is what Jesus had said himself. In red, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. I'm going to read verse 18 one more time. At once... They left their nets and followed him. We'll read it one more time just to get it in your spirit today. At once, they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. We'll read that one more time just so you get it. Without delay, he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Verse 21. They went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Verse 25, in red, Jesus says, Be quiet. I love that. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Second installment of our sermon series marked a message entitled, The Invitation. The Invitation. Let's pray together. Father, thank you, Holy Spirit, for this time together. Thank you for your church that is gathered in one place, many locations, God, as we come around the name of Jesus Help us see the way we need to see, hear what we need to hear, eyes to see. Give me the words to say today as only you can. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, come on, and all God's people said, slap your neighbor a high five on the way down and tell him, you got an invitation. Would you give it up for the worship team as we typically do? Thank you so much, worship team. We appreciate you leading us today. 
My beautiful bride is sitting on the front row today, y'all. 19, soon to be, I better, 18 right now, soon to be, 19 lovely, blissful years of marriage in December, y'all. 19. I know it's amazing because I only look 23, but listen, 19 years of marriage, and, uh, and I've been thinking about our marriage lately. It's not a counseling session, I'm jokes joking, y'all. I've been thinking about our marriage lately, particularly when it comes to preparing to get married, because my niece is going to be getting married in December. Our anniversary is this in, in December, so there's been nostalgic moments around the holidays. I love the holidays, why they're so special to us, because we that's when our anniversary is, and so I love that time of year. My niece is getting married, and, and as she's preparing, my mind goes back to... Our own season of preparing for marriage, y'all. And, 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 and if you've prepared, if you've been married, uh, you know the process of what happens. And, and if you've never had a problem or a conflict in a marriage, guess what? When you prepare for marriage, you're about ready to have one, y'all. You will. I mean, it's, it's a guarantee. There will be conflict when you get engaged and you start preparing for a marriage or a wedding. Not because of the caterer. Not because of the venue. Not because of the cake, y'all. You know where most conflict comes from when you prepare for a marriage? It's the guest list. How many know what I'm talking about? Who's going to get an invitation? Who can come? Because you can't come to a wedding without an invitation, right? So you got to go through everybody who's going to get it and who's not. Who's coming and who isn't, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, why can't my third cousin come? Because we ain't seen your third cousin in five years. That's why. What about my Aunt Bootsy? You only see Aunt Bootsy at Christmas and she's drunk every time we see her. She ain't coming. I want her to come. She's family. Family is more than blood. Come on. It's a confrontation. Who's coming? Who's going to get the invite? The invitation is a request. It is a summons. It's a beckoning. I want you to be part of this. I'm calling you to, to this event, this occasion that I want you to be part of. Now, every invitation that we receive always requires a response. I'm bad at responding. My wife and I, we have a hard time when it comes to responding to invitations because we have five kids. You know what that means? We get an invitation to a birthday party just about every day. Every day it's an invite and they want to know three weeks in advance, will you be coming to the birthday party? I need a response. And I'm like, bro, I got five kids. I don't even know what I'm doing three days from now let alone three weeks from now. I'm just trying to, it's one word, survive. Not three weeks, three hours, people. It's crazy in my life. I promise if we come, we'll stop on the way and get a gift card and a card on the way to the party. I promise you. We are bad at responding, but every invitation that you receive always requires a response. Are you coming? Are you not? Is it a yes? Is it a no? Are you in or are you out? Hey, now listen, listen, listen. I don't know if you know this or not, but God has given you an invitation. It is a request. It is an invite. It is a summons. It is a beseeching to come, and when I talk about, what I'm talking about, when I talk about invitation, what I am communicating is this. You have a calling that comes from God. This calling that comes from God comes in two different types of ways. The calling that comes from God is both spiritual and personally specific. By spiritual, what I mean is I'm talking about salvation. That salvation comes because you have been called. You thought salvation was based off of your own decisions for where you are in life. But I got news for you today. You have been called to salvation. It is salvation by an invitation. That's why at the end of our services sometimes we have an altar call. We have what some call it as an invitation to come receive Christ, right? Jesus said it this way in scripture. He said, come unto me. There's the invitation. Here's the call. Come unto me, all you who are weary laden, and I will give you rest. First Peter says it this way. In the book of First Peter, it says this. 
You are, put it on the screen, 1 Peter, here it comes for you, on the screen. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That you may declare the praises, watch this, of him who called you. Say it with me, those two words, one, two, three. Called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The book of 1 John says it this way. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Salvation is an invitation that is given to you. It is a call that has come to you. It is not, this call that comes from God is not just spiritual. It is personally specific. And what I mean by that is the call has to do with purpose. With a particular purpose that God has put on your life. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says it, says it this way. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been, who have been, say it with me on three. Let's get a little bit of gusto now. One, two, three. Called according to his purposes. You have received an invitation you have a calling that comes from God. Now, when we talk about calling, a lot of people get confused. I mean, they really do. When you talk about calling, uh, uh, people don't understand really what you're talking about. And the confusion comes from the fact that when we say calling, a lot of people think vocation. Like calling comes to the people that are pastors behind the pulpit. Pa uh, uh, calling comes to missionaries that, that find themselves somewhere overseas. It's for the elders and the deacons and the board members. I mean, that, that's, that's calling. I'm not really called to much at all. That calling comes to, some, to somewhere else. So I fe really feel like we need some clarity on what it means to have call, uh, what it means to be called. Because calling has less to do with vocation and has more to do about vision. To clearly see the gift that God has given you and placed and put on your life. Here's what I'm trying to say today. We are all called. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you look called. You look called. Brother Tim, you look called. Y'all, you, you look called. Because calling is an invitation that God has given us all. It does not just come to the missionaries. It also comes to the mailman. Calling is not just for the pastor. The calling comes to the plumbers. The school bus drivers. The construction worker. The janitor. And everybody in between. You have received an invitation you have been given a calling that even though you have received an invitation there must be a response because it's one thing to be called by God but it's quite another to come to it to come into your calling to respond to this invitation that has been put before you and this subject is what I want to talk about today as we get into Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus starts his earthly ministry walking by the seashore of, of Galilee when he sees, watch this, two sets of brothers. The first of which is Simon and Andrew. Now, right now he is called Simon. But in future texts, what we're going to see is... Jesus doesn't call him Simon. Jesus actually calls him something different. Jesus calls him Peter. Can I take a TV timeout and say this? Sometimes doesn't, God doesn't call you what you call you. Sometimes he doesn't see what you see in you. You know what God calls you? God calls you what you could be what you should be, and what eventually you will be. That's what God has called you to. It's different. He changes your name and he calls you something different. And that's what happens in Mark chapter 1, verse 17. Simon and Andrew, and watch this as he's walking on the seashore, he says this, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He calls the first set of brothers Simon and Andrew. Then he calls the second set 
which is James and John. Now, they're a little bit different. Now, they're both sets of brothers are fishermen, but we see some descriptive detail that might have a little bit of twist. It says that they were the sons of Zebedee, Zebedee, and every time you see a name inserted in Scripture, it is on purpose. Everybody say on purpose. It is put there for a reason. Then couple the fact that it said that when they followed the call, they actually left their father and the hired men, which tells us that it is in a successful fishing business that in which they are a part of. Watch what happens in verse 20. Then it says in verse 20, without delay, he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Do we see what's happening here? Two sets of brothers who are called by Jesus. Watch this. One set leaves their nets. The other set not only left the nets, but they also left their father to follow Jesus and to answer the call. Now listen to me. Are y'all following me today? This is yes. I want you to follow me today. Because the nets represent their comfort. The nets represent the livelihood. It is the nets that have been passed down generation to generation. This was what, they, they, they come from a long line and lineages, lineage of fishermen that gets passed down. This is what they are most familiar with. This is their normal. This is what they know. This is their security, the nets they hold inside their hand. Yet Jesus says, come, follow me. Let go of your nets. Leave to go the places I'm going to take you. There is no guarantee. There is no contract. There is, there is, there is nothing I'm going to put up front to say it. everything's going to be perfect. And you know what they do? They answer the call. And it shows us, watch, that they had to let go of their comfort to step into their calling. That's the first thing I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about comfort. Now, how many know, how many would, would say, yes, Pastor Mark, that's right, that we come from a culture that places high importance on our own personal comfort. Come on. I know you got that lazy boy. Don't even talk to me about that. I know you got that lazy boy. I know you like that lap of luxury. Come on, somebody. We love, we love comfort in our culture. We love comfort food. Can I get a good amen, somebody? It's called Chick-fil-A. God's chicken. The anointed chicken. Mmm. And to get a little bit more comfort on that, throw a vanilla milkshake on top with a cherry. Yes, please. And the whipped cream. Thank you. It's comfort foods that we love. A big bowl of chili on a rainy day watching the Cowboys beat the Redskins. Oh, they're not the Redskins. What's their, I don't even know their name now. But whatever their name. You know, it's just a comfort. F I'm joking with y'all. It's just, com it's com we like comfort foods. We love comfy restaurants where we got a good vibe we like to check out, where we feel good about. We love, we love, we love comfortable hotels when we travel. We don't want bed bugs. And we want a nice comfortable mattress and I get a free breakfast hello Hilton yes I will thank you we love to travel in comfort we like to ride in comfort this is what we desire the most a lap of of luxury a life of luxury I'm gonna take it a step further and say this preacher loves you but we even choose our churches based off of our own comfort See y'all next Sunday. Chew on that for a week. I got to make sure the pew is nice and comfortable. Let me check out all the programs. And I get free coffee. This is so comfortable. I believe God's called me here. Now listen to me. There is nothing wrong with comfort. I love it as much as you do. 
Here is the issue. The issue is when we take this line of logic and we put and place it in our relationship with the Lord, we got serious issues, people. Because when you take the comfort of culture and you connect it with Christ, here's the thing. We think Christ should be comfortable. That somehow when I give my life to Jesus and I say yes to him, he comes to make my life more comfortable. It should get easier when I say yes. It shouldn't be hard anymore. But I got news for you today. Jesus' mission was not to make you comfortable, but it was to bring, com to, bring, to bring alignment with the Father's will, to break the bondage of sin so you no longer could sit in it and be set free in your life. Regardless of what contemporary Christianity says, Jesus did not come to make you comfortable. See how quiet it got in here today? You know, some of y'all are saying, I don't know if I'm coming back. This don't make me feel very comfortable. We have to bring ourselves into alignment with this truth. So that way, when he begins to call us for his purpose, call us to his path, call us to his priorities and his precepts of the things that he wants, we will truly understand that we must let go of our comfort so we can be led into our calling. Some of us today, we got to drop our nets and the things that are most familiar to us and step out in faith and follow him. And sometimes that is not the most comfortable place that we could be in life when we've got to let go of what is familiar to follow God's purpose and his path for, for our life. It is not going to be comfortable. Here's what I'm saying. Coming into your calling means coming out of your comfort. I am preaching and here today if only four people are hearing me. I'm coming right down your street. You know what most people want? Most people want both. I want calling and comfort. Can I get both? I mean, can I be a fisherman and a follower? Can't, can't I step out in faith and hold on to what is most familiar? Can I have calling in my comfort? The reason why we want both is because we have adapted ourselves to the culture and we have created a Christian community. Based out of our complacency and apathy, that is why we want to have both so we can stay comfortable. But if you ever want to pursue the truest calling God has for your life, you have got to learn to untie and tether yourself Untether yourself from what is most familiar to step out by faith and follow him. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It is the letting go and being led by him. Now many of you know my testimony, how I got called into ministry. I'll share a little bit of it if you don't. I've shared it multiple times how I am a preacher. It is not like I was born one day and came out the womb like, I'm going to be a preacher one day. But this was a calling that was developed over my life. And there is one part, though, a particular part that I have left out. And it wasn't until I was at dinner with one of my friends and I was sharing with him something that I did to kind of let go. And, 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 and really received a call to ministry where he was like, bro, you got to share that sometime. And the Lord brought it back to my memory today. Some of you know my testimony where I wasn't always a preacher. Some of you from this community know that. Because you've heard stories. And they are all true. 
Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Who forgives our sins. Because I wouldn't be preaching if it weren't for the grace of God, y'all. And so, the end of my senior year, I rededicate my life. Athletics is all I knew. I went to college to play baseball. I'm out in the middle of a cornfield in Indiana. Warming up in the fall of 1998. I can't believe I've been in high school that long. In the fall of 1998, where the Lord began to speak to my heart, not in an audible voice, but it was a greater sense than that. He began to speak to my spirit and say, baseball was the only way I could get you here. But I have called you to ministry. And I don't want you to play ball anymore. I've got something else for you that I want to use you for. And so I wrestled with it, and I wrestled with it, and I wrestled with it. And then God confirmed it from some crazy events. I won't, I'll spare you the time. I went to the coach. I quit. I said, here's my scholarship. Here's the money. And I have this call that God wants me to do something else. Now, during that time, I had this, this might sound, just bear with me if you don't like sports. I, I promise this will make sense. I had this glove that I had bought the year prior. I mean, it was a nice glove. And when I went off to college, there was, there was another guy playing. He, he always commented on the glove. He's like, dude, that is a nice glove, man. Where did you get that? That thing is sweet. And he kept talking about it. And the Lord prompted my heart when I responded to the call to ministry. He said, go give him the glove. Give him the glove. So I went to his dorm room. I knocked on the door. He answered the door. And I said, here. <laughs> and he was like, what? You're, I can't know. I don't want to. I can't do that. I said, take it. It's yours. I have to do this. You know why I did it? That was my leaving the nets moment. That was my letting go. It was the glove. It was my way of, of burning the bridges. There is no turning back. I'm giving up what is most familiar and what is most comfortable to respond to my call. And after that, God began to open up doors of opportunity where I was able to then go preach and operate in a new gifting I didn't even know I had across the country with different college kids and sing all across the nation at different camps and churches. And the call God confirmed later, I did not know back then. But it took for me to let go and be led into. And I believe God is doing the same thing with many in this room today. That he is calling many of us to a give up the glove moment. To a let go of your nets and be led into whatever I'm prompting you to go into. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, can I show you something? Jesus did not say, come, follow me, and I will make you carpenters of men. Come, follow me. He told these guys, come, follow me, and I, I will make you contractors. Of men. No. This is specifically why he picked them to begin with. He was calling them based off their own competency. The qualities and characteristics of a fisherman. You are fishermen, but I'm going to make you fisher of men. It was these, con it was these qualities... It was, the, it was these very things that a fisherman have, that competency would later serve the kingdom in their full calling. Fishermen have to, have to be patient. They've got to be hard workers. They've got to have a tenacity. So what Jesus is doing is using the competency that they have and leading them into the calling. But what he would do along the way would expand their capacity. Can I tell you this? 
that oftentimes when God calls you, he will not call you outside of your own competency. Let me clear that up. I believe God is calling me to sing, but you can't even carry a tune in a bucket. Are y'all hearing me? He ain't calling you to that. God has called me to start a coffee shop. You like sipping coffee, but you don't have one clue about business. You might have good coffee, but that joker going to shut down in about a month because you don't know how to run a business. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Because he will not call outside of your own competency, but I tell you what he will do. He will call you in your competency, but he will expand your capacity. He will stretch you outside of your comfort zone so he can do something amazing in you and through you. It wasn't like when I received my call to ministry, I was a great public speaker at the most. It's not like I was like instantly open to where God's word and boom, I can communicate. No, matter of fact, I was like, God, what are you even calling me to I didn't even know I can even do any of these things but then the Lord started to remind me that you came out of sports but I'm gonna use that because you've always been a motivator you've always been a team player you've always been a pick-me-up kind of guy everybody looked to you for the speeches and the go-to's you always rallied everybody together and I'm gonna use that competency you don't even know about to expand your capacity for something greater I'm gonna use it for a spiritual need and God will do the same thing with you. Whatever the competency is he's called you to, he will expand it and it will be outside of your comfort zone until it will lead to the greatest calling God has gifted you with. Come, follow me. Y'all getting anything out of this today? I'm going to make you fishers of men so Jesus calls both sets of brothers and after he calls them he goes to Capernaum and he's in Capernaum and he starts teaching in a synagogue now the synagogue was a place where they went to worship it was a place of prayer, it was a place of reading scripture Uh, it, it was their church and in this context any visiting rabbi would have the opportunity to speak to read scripture, that is what gives Jesus so much freedom in this moment to just get up there and he starts speaking But something strange happens. You ever seen Stranger Things? Something something strange is about ready to happen when Jesus begins to speak. As he's speaking, the Bible says in verse 23, Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us? Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. I love what Jesus said. Man. Be quiet. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. When Jesus began to speak, something stood up inside of the man. And when he confronted it, and he called it out, and he spoke to it, that's when the spirit inside of that man came out with a shriek, and the man was set free. When Jesus confronted it, and he called it out, that's when it came out of the man, and he got set free. That's the second thing I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about confront. Everybody say confront. I believe with my whole heart in the power of Jesus' name that he wants us to start speaking to some things in our society, in our culture, in our community. He wants to begin for us to speak over our bloodline and things that have been passed down generation after generation that has plagued you and plagued your grandkids and plagued your kids. He wants us to speak to some things in our school system. He even wants us to speak to some things even in our own church. And what he wants us to speak is this, come out in the name of Jesus. Come out. 
He wants us to call it out and confront it because Jesus came to confront the very things that have tormented and tortured people. He wants us to confront things that have brought devastation in people's lives because when Jesus begins to speak to it, that's when things begin to be set free. John chapter 8 says it this way, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. I wonder if we would call it out and confront it and say, come out of our kids, come out of our marriage, come out of our communities, come out right now in the name of Jesus and be set free. Be set free. Be set free. Some of y'all are like, this doesn't make me feel very comfortable. <laughs> what did the pastor preach on? I don't know. He started talking about demons and shouting, and it was weird. <laughs> Made me uncomfortable. <laughs> that was kind of weird. To speak to it. To call it out. Of what he wants to do. And what he sees because some stuff will not come out unless you confront it. That's what happens in the middle of that verse that we often miss in verse 23. Did you see it? In verse 23, just then a man in their synagogue. A man in their synagogue. A man in their synagogue. Do you see it? This verse is insinuating that this man had attended for some length of time and no one ever noticed that he was dealing with something deep inside I wonder y'all how many times did this man come to church and cover up and conceal the very things that should have been revealed But when you get into the presence of Jesus, something on the inside that we know is not right begins to stand up. The question is, will you confront and deal with it or will you try to cover it up and push it back down again? Will you call it out for what it is? Because here is the deal, many of us are just like this man who come to church week after week and even know who Jesus is just like he did. But yet even though you come week after week, you're never willing to deal with your own internal demons. Now listen, listen. When I talk about demons, what I'm talking about is dysfunction. Now, everything in Scripture, when it says demon, they thought everything was a demon in Scripture. You got a stuffy nose, it's a demon. You break your leg, it's a demon. Now, I will say this. Demons are real. See, I just made some of y'all uncomfortable. I don't know about coming back next week, man. That dude, I told you, the stranger things, talking about demons, crazy. Here's the deal. There is a spiritual world around us that... We, we can't even comprehend of what is even happening. There is stuff happening all around it. But when we talk about demons here, I want to talk about your own personal dysfunctions because we got a lot of those. You know oftentimes what we do with our own dysfunctions? What we do is we cover it up instead of calling it out. I keep my own dysfunction on the down low so I don't have to easily be detected by it. And because you don't deal with it, you will stay defeated by it. Because here's the truth. Here's the truth. You can sit in something for so long that you no longer see it as an issue anymore. You don't even perceive it as a problem. Here's the deal. Maybe you've heard this word before. It's your new normal. 
If I hear that one more time, it's the new normal. And that's what most people do with the dysfunction. It just becomes part of your life. You don't even want to deal with it anymore. You don't want to see it for what it is. I don't want to call it out. I want to tuck it in and hide it away and let everybody see the perceive the perfection of what is portrayed in my life. But if I get down at the root and the heart of it, we will see some sort of dysfunction that you don't want to deal with. I just want to keep it down and keep it alive. And some of us have sabotaged our own calling because we won't see it for what it is. You know what you got to do? You got to see it and speak to it. See it and speak to it. Because you will never be set free from the very things you are unwilling to name. God can't heal parts of you that you keep covering up. That you don't want to deal with. Can I just break it down real simple for you? God will not bless who you pretend to be. You've got to deal with the deeper, deeper dysfunction and stop covering it up. Here's the truth. God has given you an invitation to be set free. But with this invitation always comes a confrontation. There will be a confrontation between your dysfunction and the divine. The question is, are you willing to deal with it? To call it what it is instead of covering it up? Name it, see it, speak to it, and watch Jesus begin to work in it. And see him begin to set you free. Here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, Jesus is calling. He's calling you out today. He's calling to you. Come out. It is the invitation. Did you see what's happening in both sets of story? The first, come. Follow me. The second, come out. It is the invitation. How will you respond to that call? Because I believe he's walking by the seashore of your life today and he's speaking. I believe he's standing up at the pulpit of your church in the inner parts of your heart. And when he begins to speak, something in you begins to stand up and say, I can't cover this up anymore. I got to come clean and allow him to heal the parts of me I keep hiding. Stand to your feet this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. How many would raise your hand and say, pray for me, pastor? I'm in that story today. Yep, I'm in that story today. I'm in that story. Look at those hands. That's exactly what happened the last service. It was the same way. This is speaking to a lot of us today because he is speaking. He's communicating. He's calling. For some of us, he's calling you to let go of the nets be led for some of us he's just been speaking to your heart saying stop covering it up deal with it deal with it I'm going to pray here in just a second I'm going to turn it back over to our all of our campuses that are watching online well, thank you so much for joining us online at Emmanuel Church my hope is that this time of worship, word, and community was encouraging to you and your faith journey today. Maybe you decided to accept Christ for the first time, rededicate your life, or maybe you just have questions about what it looks like to have Christ at the center of your life and to be in a daily relationship with him. 
So if any of that is you today, I encourage you to text the message E-Decision to the number 77411 so someone from our team can reach out to you. We can celebrate with you. We can answer any questions you might have. We can pray with you. And most importantly, we can begin to walk alongside you in your faith journey today. Well, thank you again for joining us online at Emmanuel Church. I hope you have a great week.